Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. My guest today is a woman who I think it's fair to say has a then and a now. And here she is, Christiana Zuzan. Thank you very, very much for joining us here on Talking Germany today. Wonderful. Now, uh, Christiana Zuzan used to be a very successful media personality and media manager working in the highest echelons of the business. Now, more recently, she started a family and confronted herself with the most challenging and most frightening aspect of the human experience that is our mortality. Indeed, she says, death is part of my life. Your life has been an incredible turnaround and I want to begin with the then rather than the now. And I've got a quote that I want to begin with because in a recent uh, magazine article here in Berlin, talking about your days in the media, mm -hmm. yeah, it said, you stand for glamour and hedonism. That's what they said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was interesting. Uh, um... Yeah, I was, I was curious to see what your response to that would be. Was it, was it in a, is there a, in any way a fair description of the person you were back then? Uh, you know, if you work for a TV station like MTV, yeah. how could you possibly not be uh, in that perception um, uh, of a person who loves the red carpet, uh, who loves to be with the stars, especially with the musicians, etc., etc. And you know, my job then was mm -hmm. to r put MTV into people's minds again. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so um, I sort of sat on, on the brand MTV yeah. and I, I also wanted to communicate it, um, MTV proposition mm -hmm. so I went out qu quite a lot yeah. and and had been photographed and all that so um, it's, were, were, it's you, play, were you playing a role or was it the real you I was playing a role definitely <laughs> definitely because because uh, you know I much rather love to sit in my office and to mm -hmm. um, make plans how we can improve this and improve that and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I love details also. <laughs> so that's quite the opposite then of the red carpet where you just put on your best smile you have and so on. But then again, it, I, I also liked that role. I, I liked to play that role, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's always been a role. It was not... You the know. role of the glamorous and hedonistic uh, media manager. Yeah, that's interesting. That was okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that was, okay. Yeah. That was okay time, um, yeah. When I read about it, see, I didn't, I, I didn't catch an awful lot of what was going on in your life back then when you were, when you were such a successful media personality. And when, and when I do read about it, the first thing that I notice is that you were, here in Germany, as in many countries, there's a real divide between commercial media and public sector media, sort of, that gets a little yes, bit of... Sir. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I don't have Absolutely. to explain it to you. And you were on the commercial side of the divide. Yes. Was that a choice you made or is that something that happened? Um, good question. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody from uh, the public te television never made me an offer, mm -hmm. unlike you. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, when, when, ever since I got this offer to run MTV Central yeah. Europe, it was clear I was in the co on the commercial side. Yeah. And, um, and that, yeah. the, when I read about the myth of your life back then, people talk a lot about sort of what you got up to back then. And sometimes it's rather critical. People say that a lot of the stuff that you were involved in on the commercial side of media was um, trivial. Trivial. And, that's... You, and you're a very thoughtful, philosophical person. Do you regret that when you look back at it? Do you see that it was trivial? Is that... You agree with that? I'd, yes. I'd, uh, you know what? I don't regret anything. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this big lesson I learned mm -hmm. uh, about that is that you should never try to um, sell um, um, a commercial thing like we did with Nine Live, this television channel where people could call in. And yes, everybody thought it was cheesy, cheap, trivial, mm -hmm. everything. We got all the critique you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, should, I didn't even try to turn it into something high level, high bro, high culture thing. Okay. And once I understood that, mm -hmm. um, that I said, okay, that's what it is. And I could go home mm -hmm. and read my uh, uh, Goethe or read my, uh, or watch RT or watch high profile uh, movies or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I could still, you know, be the one uh -huh. with that, live up to all my areas of interest. But you know, 
I always had enough distance mm -hmm. to what I did mm -hmm. without not being behind it. I've been always behind it. And that's something where I really think I also owe it to the team. Mm -hmm. because, and also, I'm absolutely convinced if you're not behind what you're doing, you will never succeed. Christiana, so it's an absolutely fascinating story. and, and, and it's difficult to ask you about this, but it's so central to your story, the, the way that you lost your brother yes. when you were a tiny child. Yes. Tell us about it. Okay. I was um, six years old mm. and my little brother was two and a half years, almost three, old, three years old. And um, uh, one day at home he died uh, through an accident. Um, my family was there, everybody was there, and nobody really took care of him or, or noticed. Yeah. And you know what? I do remember this very day as if it would have been yesterday. Mm. It's amazing how in a child's mind mm. such an event um, uh, um, stays for, yeah. forever. I can tell you everything. I can tell you about the weather, yeah. um, everything. And ever since... Um, it was clear in our family that all the problems uh, that might, might, might possibly arise in your later life are relative. For, this, for everything, there's a solution. Is that something that your parents told yes. you? Because, yes. because I, I read somewhere that your parents helped you to move away from the pain right. to something more livable. Exactly, yeah. and exactly. And that, that was what it was. That's, that's mm -hmm. what it was. And also my parents managed, especially my mother, she managed to turn um, this, this deep, deep uh, emotional pain over the loss of her child. Mm -hmm. She managed to turn that or trans transform that into a um, perspective, I would like to say, um, we would have on our lives mm -hmm. that would put everything into perspective. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I came home with a really, really bad mark in math, for example, <laughs> um, my mom said, that's okay, we will find a solution for that. Um, when my best friend wouldn't talk to me uh, anymore, mm -hmm. it, for me, it was the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But my mom made clear to me it's not the end of the world. There's a solution, yeah? So, um, yes, with that perspective, I grew up. And in that regard, looking at my then times, you were just coming up with, yeah. you know, l losing a, big, a great position, um, losing your reputation with all the cheesy TV nearly, channels. Nearly losing your life, because there was this other experience with the avalanche yes. in 2007. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. Um, uh, that was the other um, big, big event or big um, um, event regarding death in my yeah. life. I was in this avalanche and yeah. uh, when um, I came out of this avalanche, which, which was close to a miracle, really, um, again, d death um, knocked on my shoulder, if you want, yeah. and reminded me of the fact um, that we only live once. And you know, ever since I had... Uh, month by month, more and more, the desire to look into that, but, to look into... And that's interesting that you say that, yeah. because it, you, you, you've had the desire to face up to death. Yes. And, you, and, and somewhere you said, and I've written this down, because I found it so remarkable, you've had two children, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm sure in your life you've been blissfully in love, you've done all sorts of other things, you've been successful in business, but you have said the best experience of your life has been learning to face up to death. Yes, very much so. And I can truly recommend that also to, to everybody because it so opens up your, my eyes about what is really important. And that's not just said like this, it's important to see more of your friends, more of your family, all these things we know anyway. Mm -hmm. No, it really, really facing mm -hmm. uh, the last phase of people's lives um, turns me, um, it makes a big difference in my life. It helps me to take the better decisions in terms of not really there are so many important things in your life and not really you can take so many wrong decisions, you know, mm -hmm. because most of the decisions and the consequences of the, the decisions aren't, are not important. And that's all the things you learn mm -hmm. when you 
talk with dying people, mm -hmm. when you sit at, bed, at the bed next to the bed of dying people. And that's what you did. That Person Was Me, a remarkable title for a remarkable book. You, tell us a little bit more about your experiences with people very close to death and what they told you, what the essence of that is. Yeah, the, exactly. The, the essence, and you know, f first of all, everybody has a different judgment about his or her life. Mm -hmm. Everybody puts um, on these two pages, always only two pages, there's a big ocean and a water drop. Yeah? Everybody has a huge world of perception and experience, fascinating. Um, and the essence, to me, and the most striking things were all these sentences where people regret something, where, where many conjunctives like had a only, done this. But what did people regret most? Um, not being themselves. Not being themselves. Yes. Yeah. Not being honest about mm -hmm. what they really feel, really mm -hmm. want in mm -hmm. terms of uh, their sexuality, for example. Had I only come out of the closet earlier mm -hmm. um, or had I only led my own life and not the life mm -hmm. alongside the expectations of my parents. That was striking to me in many cases. But, to, but tell me, I mean, death is a very, very frightening thing. Most people, I mean, you have moved closer to death to have a close look at it and see mm -hmm. what that teaches you in your own life. Most people would run a mile. And for a lot of these people that, are, the, 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 mm -hmm. that have written their mini obituaries in your yes. book, one of the things that they have to cope with is they're looking death in the face in a very real way. That's frightening. To you, is it? I would imagine it's frightening to, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still in the best phase of my life and I'm mm. still physically fit and all these things. So I'm not frightened yet, but some of mm. these people are two weeks away from dying. Yes, and you know what is fascinating? Not too many people are frightened because they have the chance, and that's, by the way, what, what this job is all about mm -hmm. of us people who do this end of life mm -hmm. care is listening to them and then giving them the chance to come to uh, to 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 letting to create a space yeah. where they can be con become conscious conscious about their feelings and about their thoughts and everything and that alone the fact that there's somebody there who's 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 interested in their lives and in their thinking and in mm -hmm. their feeling that a lot that in many cases help, helps them to overcome their fears mm -hmm. of dying. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When you ask a person, and that's what we do, do you, are you afraid of dying? Uh, do you have fear of dying? Um, of course, many people say yes, but then we are not saying, oh, you needn't be afraid. That's the most stupid answer you can possibly give or most stupid advice. No, we ask them, tell us about your fear. How does mm. it feel? How does it look? Mm. What color does it have? And after that, after they can speak out about, explain their fears, they feel much better and it helps to reduce the fear. 70% of people here in Germany would like to have the right to die or say they would like to have the right to die. Does that sound like a plausible number to you, given the conversations that you've had, many, many conversations with people close to death? Yes, um, in, in a way, yes, because uh, I don't know how many people of these 70% really faced already a, a dying person, mm -hmm. um, whether or not maybe they, assist, they sat next to the bed of their mother or father and, mm -hmm. and so on. But um, I, my notion is, my feeling is that um, most of the people would like to have the option. Mm -hmm. And with that option, you know, with the pill in the drawer, mm -hmm. and with that option, they would be much more peaceful and much more, much calmer inside. Um, however, my experience from the reality mm -hmm. of these moments and days when a person leaves this world is that already now a lot is possible and a lot is being done mm -hmm. in terms of helping that person to die in the sense of the word. Meaning that, for example... You're to... talking about pal palliative medicines? Here? Yes, yeah. and, but no, I'm not talking about palliative medicine because I'm also, I'm not uh, competent in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is only to, um, to, to look for the mental and emotional state mm -hmm. of that person. Mm -hmm. How does that person feel? Yeah. And you know, when they, 
when they still can speak, then they communicate. Kate, I don't want to have um, too much pain, mm -hmm. so please give me more painkillers. Um, I'm afraid of uh, suffocating, yeah. so please help me that this is not going to happen. And what I'm saying is that there's a lot already now that can be done mm -hmm. to um, uh, um, always having um, in your mind the dignity of that person. Mm -hmm. And that's what I experienced quite often, even when the person cannot speak anymore. Together with the family, we decided then, for example, to take off the um, oxygen mask or this oxy oxygen thing. Yes. And the tubes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And give that person still a last cigarette or a last glass of whiskey or whatever this person wishes for. And, and there's a lot uh, possible in the human and humanitarian area rather than in the legal area where you would have a paragraph defining, you know, now you switch uh, switch all the machines off, etc. So I am not so much into all these medicine and and um, also the, the economy behind that. Yeah. There are also economic interests, yeah. I have to say that. Um, but I rather want to um, fight for um, a human, human, humanitarian area where people can really look how does that person feel and there's enough you can do um, to let go a person into another world um, without switch, switching off machines. When we're talking about the area we, that we are talking about, we're talking about uh, the prospect of pain, mm -hmm. great and severe pain. Yes. We're talking about the prospect of death. But another thing that people fear immensely is loneliness. And I think that's something you've come to understand yeah, it, during the exactly, work you do. Exactly. And no paragraph and no medicine and mm. no pill can help you to deal with that loneliness. That's and how do you help people to deal with that loneliness? I know that you've said, for example, you've used the German word Schweigen. Mm. You've had to learn in a completely different way, a qualitatively different way, how to be simply there and to be silent. Exactly. To be silent is one of the most wonderful and most powerful states to be in. Mm. And it helps a lot to uh, deal with that loneliness because these people are so happy that there's somebody there who's interested in them. Mm. Um, but my role is just listening, listening and not judging yeah. over what they say, only putting in focus how the dying person feels. And you know, it sounds so simple being silent, listening, but it's not, actually. And that's what we all learned in this course we all took. It's about half a year. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's a fantastic course where you really train to listen. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. I don't know how, um, how often I before listened to a person for, let's say, 15 minutes mm -hmm. without nodding or um, feeding back something. Yeah. Just being there. Just being there. And as simple as it sounds, as powerful this is mm -hmm. to help um, deal with the loneliness. Mm -hmm. You yourself have said somewhere that you don't want to die suddenly. Mm. This is related to what we're talking about. And why, why did you say that? because it's related to my biography. I lost my little brother without um, having had the chance to say goodbye. And I almost died in this avalanche, avalanche where I also never had the chance, would have had the chance to say goodbye to my beloved ones. Mm -hmm. And probably this is where I'm coming from with that desire to be able to say goodbye. And this is also why I would like to alert all of us, all of us, because eventually we are all going to die and all our relatives are going to die. And I want to alert people to actively um, uh, yeah, structure, and it's not the right word, to, but to actively look how, how you could um, uh, um, use these last hours and last minutes mm -hmm. to come up with some rituals. We all lost our rituals about um, dying yeah? mm -hmm. and to say goodbye and how you properly say goodbye to each other. And these moments 
you as a relative have on your mind until the rest of your life. And this is why this is so important um, for our society and for each of us. And this is why I like to alert more people that we should better accept that this, is, this person is going to die mm -hmm. instead of trying to prolong the life for another day. What has Berlin got today? Tell us a little bit more. We've heard a little bit in the report. What has Berlin got today that makes it such an attractive startup location? Well, actually, it's very un-German. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. In terms of being really international, truly international, mm -hmm. um, it's a very attractive um, cultural magnet for all sorts of people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. We still have affordable cost of living. Mm -hmm. So that all comes together and um, why Berlin attracts um, creative, really creative and very capable people. Mm -hmm. And um, that holds for the startup scene as much as for the art scene. Okay, that was a good sell. What are the problems? <laughs> <laughs> the problems, to my mind, um, is uh, the mindset uh, of uh, the German people in the, general. The mindset of the German people in general? Yes, meaning Being. <laughs> that um, we Germans in general, mm. of course there are always exceptions, mm. but our mindset is um, that we rather want to play it safe, we're not so much uh, risk takers, we're not so technology friendly, we're not change oriented, not, uh, unlike uh, the Americans. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, I is, personally... Is there a problem around the term entrepreneurship in Germany? Oh, yes. What's the problem? Uh, the problem is um, uh, that, again, the mm -hmm. mindset um, uh, says that an entrepreneur always only wants to exploit um, mm -hmm. all the creativity and capability mm -hmm. of their employees, their staff, mm -hmm. um, and wants to become rich and um, wants to be outstandingly rich and exploit is exploiting his, his staff. Um, as an entrepreneur in Germany, you always, yes, you have many admir admirers and you are accepted, but I've never seen an entrepreneur sticking out, being a great leader, a visionary, um, who um, has as many fans as, for example, in the US. And all these mindset things. But you will admit, I've got to, I've got to break a lance here for Germany now. You, I mean, Germany is one of the leading economies in the world. It must be getting yes. something right. Yeah, they've got, we've got all the big multinational companies based in Germany, the pharmaceutical companies, the car makers and all this kind of stuff. Germany's also got the famous Mittelstand, all these me small and medium-sized businesses where people are having ideas, producing goods, selling them all around the world, creating jobs. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing to say against that. I think we have a lot to offer in Germany and yeah. we should be much more proud of ourselves. I'm just answering your question why an entrepreneur probably would not... Have, there's always another connotation than in other countries. That's interesting. And mm -hmm. um, I think... Is it changing, though? At all? I cannot see this, oh, no. God, that's not very encouraging. I yeah. cannot see... Yes, of course, you shouldn't be um, um, uh, devastated just because of that. I just think there's a lot enough mm -hmm. we as Germans have to offer in mm -hmm. terms of reliability and, and uh, making all these processes, etc., etc. And, and, you know, we have Silicon Valley and we have in Berlin, we have a little bit of Silicon Valley here. Silicon Alley. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but my experience is that if you really want to start as an entrepreneur, in, in Germany, if you want to start, yeah. Um, after a while, um, you you notice uh, uh, that um, there are. Um, if you would um, work as an employee instead, yeah, you would get better acceptance. I see. Interestingly, because you really know you know what you're talking about from your own personal experience, but you also yes. I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure how it worked. But I heard that you you were able to get you got some money to go off to the U.S. and travel around the U.S. I mm -hmm. mean, this is fantastic to 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 meet the people you wanted to meet and talk to them about business, and you even got to meet Steve Jobs. Yes, that you was not that I got some money, there. but I got this wonderful Eisenhower Fellowship, uh -huh. which is a program mm -hmm. um, by um, the Eisenhower Foundation. That's yeah. absolutely fantastic. They invite people from all over the world mm -hmm. and I had the big honor to be invited and that was in 2006 mm -hmm. to travel through the US and mm -hmm. yes you they open doors um, uh, to their fellows to meet certain people and I had this incredible luck uh, to meet uh, Steve Jobs mm -hmm. that was in 2006 and all my friends said oh you have to ask him when he's going to launch the iPhone because at this time <laughs> uh, there was no iPhone uh -huh. yet uh -huh. Uh -huh. and instead we had a conversation where we just talked about guess what death 
Really? So it was an atmosphere and a kind of a conversation where I really could not interrupt and say, hey, Steve, when is the iPhone uh, going to be launched? But, but why did you talk about death? <sighs> I don't know. Uh, it sort of came up. Isn't this amazing? And I have to say, I was I'm just really wondering whether this was you or whether it was him or whether presumably both of you. Presumably both. And, you know, maybe he read in my eyes um, how shocked I was about his thinness because at the time already, that was after his first operation, mm -hmm. when he didn't make that public yet, um, he was already that thin um, yeah. that he was bef uh, right before he it died. It was a serious situation. Yes, and maybe I couldn't hide my uh, shock. Your reaction. My yeah. reaction, Your surprise. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, interesting story. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been talking about startups, Berlin, is or wants to be a, a major startup capital. For sure, it is a cultural capital. The art world is certainly well represented, which is good news for Christiana Zusaun because she is a passionate art collector. Uh, she particularly likes the work of Kurt Schwitters, who in the first half of the 20th century got up to all sorts of interesting stuff. He's particularly well known for his collages. And as we find out now, he's the subject of another very interesting art form, the comic book. A Dadaist as a comic book hero, Kurt Schwitters, the collage artist from Hanover, drawn by Norwegian graphic artist Lars Fiske in Herr Mats. In 1919, Schwitters started using the term Mats to describe his way of working. It's the second syllable of Komats, commerce, and he used the fragment in a collage. I take any material the picture demands, explained the artist, who was forced to leave Germany under the Nazis. In 1937, he went to Norway, and three years later to England, where he also painted commissioned portraits in order to earn a living. But collage remained most important to him. Schwitters influenced artists from Robert Rauschenberg to Joseph Beuys, and as a pioneer of modernism, he continues to inspire others to this day. He would certainly have enjoyed becoming a cartoon himself. That looks like a very interesting Norwegian uh, comic book, cartoon book, yeah, about Kurt Schwitters. You have a great passion for Kurt Schwitters. You collect his stuff, yeah? Why? Um, I'm fascinated be, be, um, of his um, irony and the self-irony. Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, there's a lot of humour in there, isn't there's there? There's a lot yeah. of humour. Yeah. And, you know, if such a such an approach to making art mm -hmm. uh, with such profound humor and irony becomes so relevant mm -hmm. and his art has become really really relevant and he's a big reference artist also to all sorts of generations after after him um i, I think uh, that's just fantastic it's interesting uh, i i i came across a quote uh uh, he lived until after the Second World War, but at the end of the First World War, when he was particularly active, when he, got, he began to make collages, he said something very interesting about the wartime and the impact that it had. He said, everything has broken down mm -hmm. and new things need to be made out of the fragments. What a great quote, because good, that's it? exactly because that really the foundation explains for collage. The, exactly. That's what collage is. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. if you put that into, into this time perspective after the uh, First World War, mm -hmm. here you can see what art can really do to, oh, yeah. to help also overcome such a, such a period of time. But anyway, um, he, led, he set the foundations for his own collages yeah. uh, with that. And um, I'm particularly interested in the question what a collage would be in the 21st century. Because at the time, at Twitter's time, there was That's no digital. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And now with all our digital possibilities, yeah. think of all the videos, etc., etc., and all, also art that is algorithmically generated. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm trying would... to work out how that would look. Well, can, can you describe it for me? Uh, no, I can't. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, you need to uh, have your f fantasy in, in, your, in your mind. But mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what inspires me, this mm -hmm. question, what can you do? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of collages can you generate in mm -hmm. the 21st century? And uh, what's the definition of collage? Yeah. And all these things. So Schwitters, for me, is the inspiration mm -hmm. for um, the focus of our art collection. How many works by Kurt Schwitters do you 
possess. Oh, I'm not telling you this. <laughs> oh, you're not no. telling me. No? Because it's, it's a, not it's important. A, it's a, it's not Would important. I say 10? Would I say 100? Would I say mm -hmm. 1? Okay. It's not important for... Um, I'm guessing you've got more than one. And the interesting thing was he used all sorts of different materials and there were phases in his life where he was extremely impoverished because of the circumstances he was living in. And I read that he used, he even used in one phase when he was living in England... Exactly, yeah, there was he just... Used, he used yeah. porridge. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> to make a collage. Do you have a collage made with porridge? <laughs> no, materials? I don't have, but I'd, <laughs> okay. I'd love to have one. Because isn't this great how he yeah. deals then with the, with the cultural uh, circumstances yeah. uh, he's in? I think he's, this guy is, was just fantastic. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so you have a collection of collages. Yeah? Do, you, do you exhibit them? Yes, uh, once in a while. Mm -hmm. I lend it to museums. Mm -hmm. uh, we work very closely together with Berlinische Galerie mm -hmm. here in Berlin, who mm -hmm. have... Prestigious, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and they have the Hannah Höch archive, mm -hmm. and Hannah Höch is another artist. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful artist, yeah. Yes, yeah. and, and I, I adore a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, um, then we uh, put together works from our collection with their collection, yeah. and um, do, do shows uh, together. Mm -hmm. and and also, um, as of the end of this year, we will, we will be showing parts of the collection in our own building, which we will be opening up then. Interesting. Do you do collages, little collages with your kids? Yes, absolutely. That is great fun. <laughs> yes. Exactly. When my kids were a little bit younger, that was one thing we could spend a whole weekend doing collages. Yeah. And you know what the great thing about it is? You can visualize emotions. Mm -hmm. And... What I love, especially when kids do this kind of art, mm -hmm. they say, why, why um, uh, couldn't a fish be, have, an, have a completely different pattern or completely different color or so? Uh, why would a whale always need to be black or white or gray? And they create a red whale, for example. I love it because it so. it so broadens uh, your fantasy. <laughs> your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, We've just got time for our little quiz at the end of the show, a traditional Talking Germany quiz. I'm going to begin, or I'm going to finish where I began. Yeah? Okay. Uh, glamour or hedonism? Uh, neither one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Yeah. Okay, the, the same sort of thing. Uh, because you you have been uh, a celebrity of a certain yeah, absolutely. kind. Yeah, I, have, I yeah. need to correct myself would, on this. Would, hedonism, I'm, I'm, I'm a hedonist. Absolutely, really? I That's am. Good. I love people who, who, who say it in the open, yeah? Absolutely. Would you prefer to be recognised when you go down the street or not recognised? Not recognised because I can observe much better. Is life more about pain or comfort? Life our, in our modern times is much more about uh, comfort and about excluding pain of our lives. We're going to leave it there. That's your lot with the charming, multifaceted and brave Christiana Suzanne. Bye-bye.